You drift out of an egg into open ocean and immediately realize you're not supposed to be here. You're a speck of flesh with a tail, bobbing in the water with 2,000 siblings who hatched in the same burst. Your mother is gone. She released you into the current and vanished. A wall of translucent threads drifts toward you all. Jellyfish. Its tentacles spread 40 times wider than your body, each one loaded with microscopic harpoons. Two siblings drift into those threads. Their bodies jerk once, then freeze. You watch them disappear inside while the jellyfish keeps drifting toward you. You try to swim. Nothing happens. You barely move. A current pushes you sideways toward those same tentacles. You're one of the worst swimmers in the entire ocean, and your nightmare is just beginning. You're drifting through open water, starving. Your only job is to find food and not become food. You're failing at both. You're drifting and starving. A copepod swims past tiny shrimp, smaller than a grain of rice. You lunge. Your body barely moves. The copepod rockets away. You have a tail that paddles like a broken stick. Then the water goes dark. An arrow worm drops from above, five times your length. Hooked jaws spread wide. It doesn't chase, just falls toward you mouth first. You thrash. Your useless tail spins you sideways. Jaws snap shut where your head was. The worm curves back for another pass. You go limp. Stop moving. Let the current spin you like trash. The worm tracks movement, not garbage. Its eyes pass over you. It drifts away. That's your only survival trick, playing dead. You'll need it constantly because you can't outswim anything, ever. For two weeks, this is life, starvation and terror. You eat when food bumps into your face. You dodge predators by pretending to be debris. Out of 2,000 siblings, 99% won't survive. That's not drama, that's the math. Skip forward three weeks and something's happening to your body. Your fins itch, then burn, then start swelling from inside. The bones stretch and twist. Your side fins balloon into fat, stubby lumps. They don't look like fins anymore. They look like elbows. Your body flattens. Your head widens. You feel heavier. Your spine compresses, vertebrae crushing together. Each joint locks into place as your skeleton reshapes itself. It feels like your body is turning to stone from the inside out. Then you start sinking. You can't stop it. The pressure builds 50 meters, 80, 100. Sunlight disappears. Temperature drops. Your eyes burn as they adjust to the darkness. Every meter down feels like your body is being squeezed in a fist. Your fins finish transforming. They're thick, fleshy stumps now, leg fins. These aren't for swimming anymore, they're for walking. You hit the seafloor, try to swim. You look like a pancake having a seizure. Scientists call it drowning cow swimming. Your front fins plant into sand, back fins push. You waddle forward in a clumsy hop, three feet and you're exhausted. You're a fish that can't swim. You'll spend the next decade walking at the speed of a tired crab. Everything down here is faster than you. Skip forward two months and you're starving again. You've figured out the basics. Hide during the day in rock crevices. Come out at dawn and dusk when prey moves more. But catching that prey? Nearly impossible. A shrimp crosses the sand 15 feet away. Food. You start walking. Hop. Pause. Hop. By the time you've covered five feet, the shrimp's gone. You chase a crab. It sees you from 20 feet away and walks, not runs, walks to safety. Here's your problem. You can't chase anything. Those stubby leg fins have no speed. No burst. You're built to stay perfectly still. So you try it. Press flat against sand. Your skin changes color brown and gray patterns matching the seafloor. You disappear. Then wait. Two hours. Three. A porcelain crab picks through sand three inches from your face. Your head snaps down. Mouth opens. Throat expands like a vacuum. The crab gets sucked in. One meal. After six hours, you burned almost as many calories waiting as you gained eating. But you've got a secret weapon. That fleshy bump on your head? It's a fishing rod. You extend it and a tiny lure pops out right in front of your mouth. It oozes chemicals that shrimp and crabs can smell from far away. Prey comes to you. You deploy the lure, wiggle it. Wait, two minutes pass. Nothing comes. The lure stops working. That's it. Two minutes of bait, then you wait and try again. This is your life now. Sit for hours, deploy bait for two minutes. Hope something wanders close, miss more than you hit. Skip forward four months. You've grown to eight inches, covered in bumpy skin. Those bright red lips have developed on your face, scientists don't know why. Maybe for attracting mates. Maybe for recognizing your own species. You just look like a fish wearing lipstick. You're wedged in a crevice when the water shifts. A shadow passes above. Grouper. Four feet long, mouth big enough to swallow you whole. You press flat. Hold still. Maybe it won't see you. Then the grouper starts shaking its head up and down, short jerky movements, like a signal. From below, a shape slides out. Moray eel. Six feet of muscle with bone-crushing jaws. It moves toward your crevice. They're hunting together. Grouper signals eel. They attack in ships. One flushes prey, one catches it. Scientists have filmed this. It's real. The eel's head appears at your entrance. Mouth opens, rows of teeth gleaming. You're trapped. Can't swim away. Grouper above, eel in front. 
The eel pushes in. You scramble backward deeper into rocks. Teeth snap an inch from your tail. You hit the back wall. Nowhere to go. The eel's head fills the entrance. Its body squeezes through the gap, crushing against the rocks. You can smell it dead fish on its breath, blood in the water from its last kill. Then it stops. Too narrow. Can't reach you. For 20 minutes, they take turns probing. The grouper tries from above. The eel tries from three different angles. You press yourself so flat against the rock your skin scrapes raw. Then they leave. Got bored. You stay in that crevice for six hours. This is every predator encounter. You can't escape by swimming. You hope your hiding spot holds or the predator finds easier meals. When luck runs out, you're dead. Skip forward a year and your secret weapon betrays you. You're positioned in your usual spot, camouflaged, patient, hungry. You extend your lure and start the two minute countdown. 30 seconds in, the water moves. Something's coming, something big. An octopus slides across the sand toward you. Eight arms, each one covered in suckers that can taste and grip. It's not coming for your bait, it smelled your bait, and now it's coming for you. You can't run, you know this. So you flatten and freeze, hoping camouflage saves you. The octopus stops two feet away. One arm reaches out, tapping the sand. Testing. Another arm extends toward you. The suckers brush your skin. It knows you're here. The arm wraps around your body. Then another. The suckers grip your rough skin but can't get purchase. Your bumpy texture makes you hard to hold. You thrash, twist, one arm slips off. The octopus repositions. This time it goes for your head. An arm covers your gills. You can't breathe. You buck wildly, slamming your body against the seafloor. Something tears. The octopus releases and jets backward, trailing a damaged arm. You ripped it off. You stay pressed to the sand for an hour, gills heaving. The one tool that's supposed to feed you just invited something that almost killed you, and you'll have to use it again tomorrow because you have no other way to eat. Skip forward two years. The water is warming. Temperature climbs one degree, then two. The currents that bring cold, rich water from the deep start slowing. Then, the food disappears. Plankton dies. Shrimp that eat plankton vanish. Crabs that eat shrimp vanish. Everything you hunt stops existing. Your lure still works. Nothing comes because nothing's there. Deploy bait. Wait. Nothing. Deploy again. Nothing. One tiny shrimp in three days? Not enough. This is El Nino. Warm water pushes in and blocks the cold currents. Food chain collapses from the bottom up. In 1982, it got so bad that temperatures rose 8 degrees. One fish species disappeared completely hasn't been seen in 40 years. Probably extinct. In 2015, it caused disease outbreaks that killed 86% of some fish populations. You're starving. So is everything else. The few prey items left get hunted by everything that didn't leave. You try moving to deeper water where it's cooler. Your leg fins carry you 200 feet before you collapse from exhaustion. You're burning calories you don't have to move to places that have no food either. After three weeks of near starvation, temperatures drop. Food returns. You survived. But you're thinner, weaker, and another El Nino is already forming somewhere in the Pacific. Skip forward four years. You're ancient by batfish standards. Red lips faded, leg fins stiff. You've survived coordinated attacks, starvation events, and being born as one of the worst designed fish in the ocean. A decade of walking across the same patch of seafloor, deploying your two-minute lure, waiting for food that usually never comes. Today you're hunting near the reef edge when shadows fall across the sand. Not predators, shapes with bubbles trailing behind them. Divers, cameras, lights. One of them spots you, points. The others swim closer. You flatten and freeze. Your camouflage is perfect. A camera pushes toward your face, flash. Your eyes burn white. You jerk backward, blinded. Your leg fins scramble against sand, but you're disoriented, moving in circles. The divers keep shooting. More flashes. You stumble into open water, completely exposed, still seeing spots. By the time your vision clears, you're in the middle of the sand flat. No cover anywhere, and something is already watching. A white tip reef shark, six feet long. It saw you flailing. You try to walk back to the rocks. Hop, pause, hop. The shark circles once, twice, closing the gap. You're 30 feet from cover. At your speed, that's five minutes of walking. You have 20 seconds. The shark makes its decision, comes in fast and low. You do the only thing you can flatten against sand, stay still, hope camouflage works one more time. It doesn't. The shark's jaws close around your body. You feel the teeth pierce your skin, feel yourself lifted off the seafloor for the first time since your fins transformed into legs. The shark shakes its head once, twice, then releases you. You sink back to the sand, torn and bleeding. You're not even worth eating. Just another weird looking bottom fish that tastes wrong. The shark swims away. But the damage is done. You can't move your back fins anymore. Blood clouds the water around you. Within minutes, crabs appear. Then more. They don't wait for you to die. They start with your fins, tearing pieces while you're still breathing. After eight years of outsmarting predators, after surviving food chain collapses, after being born as a fish that can't swim, 
and learning to hunt by sitting still for hours you got killed because someone wanted a photo of your stupid red lips. Life as a red-lipped batfish, born into a body that can't escape anything, hunting with a lure that only works two minutes, surviving on luck until the luck runs out. And believe it or not, there's an animal with an even worse life. Watch that story next.